During the German occupation of France, the, the lives of the people here would have been turned completely upside down. Uh, homes would have been occupied, businesses would have been occupied, and, and really the, the French people lost a lot of their freedom. And uh, if you were one of the, the higher ups in the German army, well, you might have made your headquarters in some place like this right here. Uh, we are in Normandy, in the, the Utah Beach sector, and this right here is the home that served as the headquarters for German General Wilhelm Falle. Well, this right here is the French home that served as the headquarters for General Wilhelm Falle, who was the uh, commanding general of the 91st Air Landing Division of the German Army. And uh, <laughs> this place is something else. Uh, now, Falle wasn't the only uh, famous German general who uh, utilized this particular home. Uh, there's a, a really famous photo of General Erwin Rommel uh, coming out of these doors with Fally and a couple other members of the German high command. Uh, so anyway, Eric happens to uh, know the guy who, who owns this home. So uh, we're gonna go inside and, and take a, a quick look at General Fally's headquarters. now walking into this home and uh, dang uh, if you were a German general in World War II I can see why you would maybe pick this place to set up your headquarters uh, man this place is nice all right we're going to take just a, a quick look around this place uh, now, I asked the owner, a uh, guy by the name of Simon, if the furnishings in this house are original, and, and he said they are not. Uh, I, original to you know, the time period of 1944 is what I mean, and, and he said they're not. Um, it was owned by his family originally, and then there were some nuns that had it for a while, and then uh, he ended up buying it back. And right now, uh, he's associated with an organization called the Normandy Institute, and they're looking at uh, transferring ownership of this historic home over to the Normandy Institute. I think they're in the process of uh, raising money for that right now. But yeah, he, he has different things in here uh, associated with World War II and the role that this building played in the Battle of Normandy. I mentioned that there was a famous photo that was taken on the front steps of the Fally headquarters of Rommel and some other high-ranking German officials. Well, here is that photo. So this right here is Wilhelm Fally. Again, he's the uh, Lieutenant General of the 91st Air Landing Division. Uh, here is Rommel, who really needs no introduction. He was the Army Group B commander and was here uh, you know, on his round of inspections. I think this was taken in mid-May of 1944. Uh, this guy right here, uh, his name was uh, Misa, Misa, uh, Wilhelm Misa. And um, he was on, on Rommel's staff. And uh, this guy right here uh, was Friedrich Ruja, if I remember right, and he was the, the naval advisor to Rommel. 
But yeah, that famous picture was taken just out front here. Hey, uh, I was just looking here, and uh, it seems that Rommel was not the only well-known figure from World War II to visit this place. Uh, looks like it was also visited by Captain Miller. Uh, that's actually Tom Hanks. All right, well, that was the headquarters of uh, German General Wilhelm Falle. As I mentioned, uh, there's a, a process that is ongoing to get this place transferred over to the Normandy Institute. They're, they're doing some pretty cool things uh, as far as uh, advancing education and leadership development and things like that. So I'm gonna put a link to uh, their website in the description. Now, on D-Day, Falle was actually not at this location. Uh, he was out. Uh, basically overseeing some wargaming exercises and was on his way back to his headquarters when uh, he happened to have a run-in with some guys from the 82nd Airborne Division. So we're going to, to move now and, and go to that spot. All right, we've moved maybe uh, a mile or two away from uh, Fally's headquarters, and right here along this road is where this story gets wild. Now, on the night of June 6th, there were some guys from the 82nd Airborne who, who dropped in this area. There were about 10 or 12 of them that got together, and as they were making their way down this road, here kind of where the, the bend in the road is at, there was this German mobile communication center with a tent on the other side. And they found out that it, they searched it, it was empty, and they found right here along this ditch a uh, communications cable or uh, like a, an electric line or something. So, so they picked it up and they start just following it down this road. And as they're making their way down the road, the way that I am right now, in the moonlight, they caught sight of this house right here. Uh, now, with me today, I have uh, Paul Woodage from World War II TV. They actually did a show on this story and uh, anyway, I'm gonna link up with him and have him kind of tell a, a little bit of what happened right here at this very spot. It is the middle of the night on June the 6th, 1944, absolutely pitch black, and a group of 82nd Airborne paratroopers under the command of Lieutenant Malcolm Braddon from 3rd Battalion, 508th, are coming towards us down this little track that morning. Further up there, they had just found a tent with some a telephone exchange and evidence of some kind of German headquarters. They then rather nervously approach this massive building here, not quite knowing what it is. And then they stop here, they knock on the door and hope that the French can tell them where they are. The lady of the house comes out or looks out the window and says where they are. And they realize that they're not too far from their drop zone. As they're engaging her, his men kind of deploy around here, just kind of getting into the shadows so in case anything happens untoward. As they're conversing with the French owner of the house, everyone hears a sound of a car engine approaching and hurtling around that corner was a German staff car. As it gets this point here, Brannon, his men open up on it, M1s, Thompson submachine guns. The driver of the car, a German corporal, either loses control of it or he's wounded. The car careens off the road here, smashed into the side of the building here. The German corporal kind of crawls off round there where after a couple of minutes or so he's disarmed by the, uh, the, the paratroopers. In the front of the car is a German officer. He's dead by the enfilade of gunner fire there, but a th uh, another German officer was in the back of the car and he's been thrown out by the impact of the, tra uh, the crash because the doors opened the, the other way back then. And he's in the road here. And the story is that his pistol, he'd been riding it with it in his hand, has skidded across the road and sort of landed there. 
Malcolm Brennan, the officer, has jumped across the side of the road. He's higher up on an earth bank or something over here. And he sees the German seeing his pistol and he shouts to German like, uh, halt, stop, or I fire. The German in English says, don't shoot, don't shoot. And again, he says, D don't shoot, uh, uh, stop, or I'll fire. But the German does not stop crawling for this pistol. And as his fingertips get an inch or two away from the pistol, Brannon opens up, his men open up, and the German is killed here uh, before he can get to his pistol and potentially kill any of these Americans. They have no idea who this car is. I have no idea where it's going, who's in it. Um, but when things calm down, the German officer's hat, either the German from the front of the car or the German in the road, a hat was found in the road here. He picked it up, but before uh, looking at it, in the name band was written the name Fally. Now at that time, whatever time it was, four o'clock in the morning of June the 6th, the name Fally mean, mean, meant nothing at all to Malcolm Brannan. They later found out, of course, it was Major General, uh, Lieutenant General Wilhelm Fally, the commander of the 91st Air Landing Division. He had been killed here on his way, we think, to the command post down there with a telephone exchange to essentially set the 91st Division into action to now counter-attack towards the Utah Beach, potentially, or towards the drop zones, but he never got a chance to get there. He never got to go to telephone exchange because he was killed right here in the morning by randomly bumping into a patrol of lost paratroopers. All right, and uh, with that, General Wilhelm Valley became the very first general to be killed on D-Day and in the Normandy campaign. We have one more stop that we're gonna make. So we're gonna hop back in the car and uh, take a, a quick little jog down the road to show one more thing. Whenever people come to Normandy, uh, if they visit a German cemetery, the one that they usually go to is La Combe. It's, it's really large. It's uh, pretty easy to get to. It's right off of a main highway. And many don't realize that there are actually multiple German cemeteries in Normandy, like this one here at uh, Orgland. We're not going to spend just a, a ton of time here at Orglan just because we're maintaining a, a pretty aggressive tempo, but I did want to point something out. This cemetery is really a lot different than Le Combe. Uh, for one, the, the headstones are, are much different. And something else that's different, if you look at this headstone, well, there is a gentleman by the name of Zimmerman, uh, a Stukel, and Grigirzik who are buried here. But if you go on the other side of the headstone, well, you can see that there's one unknown soldier, uh, somebody by the name of Struk, and then another soldier. So underneath this stone are actually the remains of six German soldiers. Here again, we have another German grave that holds the remains of multiple soldiers. Looks like, I'm guessing, an Albert Lushevsky, uh, Adolf Vorholt, and a Fuchsluger. And then if we go over here to the other side, you see there is a Hermann Ludwig, a Fritz Klaw, and General Wilhelm Fally, killed on June 6, 1944, the very first German general killed in the Battle of Normandy. 
and he rests right here. All right, well, that was the headquarters, the death site, and the final resting place of the first German general to be killed in the Battle of Normandy. Uh, pretty amazing to be able to uh, visit these sites and kind of walk in the footsteps of others and, and kind of relive the, the history and uh, make it more tangible. So anyway, if you ever get a chance to come to Normandy, definitely come to, to these places.